damn it. Yeah, so apparently my buttons don't work for starting and stopping things with the keyboard. Anyway, welcome to day one of CS141. I figured nothing gets you more excited about learning computer science than bagpipes, because what gets anyone more excited about anything than bagpipes? Cool. Um, so, uh, this is some of the preliminary stuff for 141. I'm recording all this with QuickTime, which means they have absolutely no ability to edit anything uh, without learning how to use iMovie or something like that, and I just don't have the patience for that. So, this will probably be messy and horrible because I do everything in one take. Um, so what I want to do, kind of cover some of the preliminary stuff about uh, introductory computer science, so why should you study computer science, um, some of the very, very basic uh, technical things, um, and then get into just a little bit of content to get us ready for uh, those very first uh, day or two of class. So why should you study computer science? Come up with um, whatever reasons you can think of. Did you come up with some reasons? Okay, everything you thought of is probably right. One thing to note um, that I want to note is that we have really fun jobs in this field. It's, a, it's an awesome field. There's exciting things. One of the things we do that's great is we can actually help you solve other people's problems. So bioinformatics, you've got a whole bunch of DNA or RNA or some other kind of NA, um, and uh, you need to learn stuff about it. There's a lot of patterns to find. There's statistics to do. There's billions of letters that need to be chomped through. Uh, computer scientists are good at this stuff. Human-computer interactions, really fun field kind of branches with cognitive psychology looking at, you know, you've got two ways of using a mobile device. Which one's better? Well, what do you mean by better? Do you mean faster? Do you mean less error-prone? There's ways of measuring that. It's awesome. Of course, there's robotics and video games. Um, those are really cool. Digital medical records is an exploding field right now. There's Farmville. Just kidding, that's not really um, a major problem that we're solving, but, you know... Um, there is a huge exploding market for um, online games, social games, and and mobile games. Now that everybody, you know, you know, God forbid, you should spend more than eight seconds of idle time without your your face looking down at your, you know, mobile device and so on. So there's a lot of really really cool stuff happening in this field. And if you start studying this and you really put a lot of work into it, um, you can be a part of it. And I, I do want to stress that this takes work. Uh, this is not. Um, every discipline you're going to study is going to be hard in some way. This field is no different. Um, the thing that you're running up against is this is not a subject that's taught in most high schools. So you've had some amount of chemistry and physics and biology, even if you didn't have a particularly good teacher. You kind of have some idea of what those things are. Most people don't even know what computer science is when they get to college. So you're fighting against that. Um, as well, so for a lot of people, this field's going to seem tougher. It isn't tougher than uh, than than any other field. Every field's challenging, but um, this is going to seem harder because it's going to probably be very different than anything you may have done before. But you just got to put in the work. You just got to put in the time. It's like you know, you may not be really good at I don't know badminton or bocce ball or something like that. You got to put in the time. So um, what I want to do is demo a couple of programs that you'll probably write uh, this term. Uh, two of them we're definitely going to do. One of them I'm not entirely sure of. So let's start with the Lord of the Rings quiz, if I can find it. Um, of course I can't. You know, you would think, see, and this is going to go in the final take because I am not redoing that intro. That I, I, see how I nailed it in that intro? Oh my gosh, really? Seriously? We don't have it anywhere? Okay, here we go. Bada boo, bada boo. But a boo. Ha ha! There it is. The Lord of the Rings quiz. Watch how this works. Bam! Pick a number of rings. One to choose the rings, or two to choose a Middle Earth race. Let's do two. Pick a Middle Earth race. Let's go with elves. How many rings did the Dark Lord give to the elves? Uh, two. Wrong! The elves received three rings. Um, let's do that again. That was because it was just really fun. Let's get rid of this thing. There we go. Um, so if you notice what I'm doing, you know, I've got this thing here. This is called BlueJ. It's our editor. We'll look at this in more detail. Um, this stuff down here you don't have to worry about because uh, we're not going to have it. Um, this is the main program. 
um, I right click on it and if I come up with a thing called void main um, I click that and then I just ignore this and hit OK it fires up and then we get this little box here enter one to pick, let's pick a number of rings this time how many magic rings? nine what? oh wow there's an error in this program that's fantastic that's really weird. I don't know how there's an error in here. I pulled this from a student that I gave a hundred to this code, so apparently I did not grade something accurately. Well, moving on. Uh, what race received seven magic rings? How about the dwarves? Wrong. The humans received nine magic rings. Uh, then they became evil and are now ring wraiths. Go figure. Um, yeah, this this is a printing error. It, it it clearly knows the right value, but it just went ahead and printed the wrong value. That's kind of interesting. So if you have a whole bunch of stuff in this terminal window, um, if you run the program again, watch this. We run it again. Bam. See, it's just printing right after it, so it's kind of all in the place there together. Now suppose we're Weisenheimers and we put like 89. You know, it's going to say didn't enter one or two, not a valid choice. Um, at this point... Uh, on a Windows, you'd hit Control K. On a Mac, you would hit Apple K, and that clears out this terminal window. That's kind of a useful thing to know. So that's one of our first assignments. In fact, it may be our first programming assignment. Is you'll actually implement that. Now you don't have to do Lord of Rings. You can do like what sport has how many players, or you can do um, what other ones have we seen? I don't know. We've seen some clever ones over the years. These are Knox students writing these, so so when I've used this assignment in the past, I've gotten some really clever ones. We don't use it every year, but but when we do, we usually get really clever things. So that's one really cool thing. Uh, what else are we looking at that's really cool? Well, we can simulate craps. So we're going to run this. One game of craps. Wow. You rolled 11 right away. You won. Isn't that awesome? Let's try it again. Um... 10, so you have to roll again, then a 4, roll again, and then um, a 7, and so you lost. I don't know if you know how to play craps or not. Um, and then we can simulate many games of craps. Woohoo! How many games? Let's, let's do like 10,000 games. So it simulated them all and found out that, you know, you lost more than you won. The, the point of this is to show you that gambling is bad, and also because it's a kind of a cool assignment. So that's another thing that we might get to do um, later in the term. But that stuff's not nearly as cool as um, if I can find it. Here we go. Lab 5, image filters. So we right-click image tool. We fire this up. Hit enter. Bam! Now we have to pick, choose a picture. Let's look at a picture of Teresa. Cool. So we've got all these different image filter things here. We can flip horizontal, we can flip vertical, we can mirror, Ooh, we can convert to black and white, we can scale up, we can darken the shade, we can go to zombie vision. Wah! Very exciting. Um, restore back to the original. Let's do button number one. Look at this. It just sort of like adds snow to it. So um, you're going to implement all of these from flip horizontal down to zombie vision. Everybody's going to do those. Then you've got these four buttons where you can sort of pick your own thing. We've got like the classic, you know, Beatles album cover sort of thing. That's kind of exciting. What do these do? Well, that's like a different type of flip. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so that's another thing that we can do. Um, and then there's another version of this in here somewhere, if I can find it. Lab 5. This was another student's version of Lab 5 from a couple of years ago. Um, let's work with a picture of Teresa again. Ah, yes, mosaic. Wham! I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but it's a really, really cool effect. And we can go quarter zombie. Woo! Woo! And we can make it very green. Um, and then, of course, you can, you know... Well, I guess scale down wasn't implemented. Ah, well, this student didn't get 100 on every part of it. Wow. A number of parts of it didn't work. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Um, so that's another pretty cool lab, uh, another pretty cool program that you'll get to write. Um, so we're doing some really sweet image manipulation stuff. Um, so those are some of the sorts of things that, that, that we're heading towards being able to do. Um, now, the program I was using to do all that is called BlueJay. It's sort of like Microsoft Word, 
for writing Java programs. So Microsoft Word is to papers as BlueJ is to Java programs. Uh, now there's a standard uh, procedure for getting a hold of code and running it for like a lot of the lab assignments. You're not just going to start with a new project. You'll have what's called starter code or starter files or starter package up on Moodle. So I'm going to show you how you would download that. Um, oh, and I got to exit my slides to do that. Um, you can't see this, but there's a little screen recording icon from QuickTime I just had to move. Um, so here we are with Moodle. You can see this is still in progress. So here's the Hello World example. I'm going to click this. Wow, this is slow today. There we go. And I'm going to save the file. And I'm going to save it. Oh, that's not where I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it 141. I'll make a new folder for myself. Um, I'll call it temp because it's temporary stuff. And in there I will put hello.zip. Uh, now on the file system, if I go there to my 141 folder into temp, you'll see I have the zip file. The first thing you have to do when you download it is unzip it. Now on Macs, this is easy. You just double click it. It'll unzip it. On Windows, if you double click it, it will open the file, but not unzip it and let you like sort of look at what's inside it. You can actually open a zip file with BlueJ, but you can't edit any files. This sucks. So what you need to do on Windows is right click it and go down to um, unzip or decompress or something like that. On a Mac, you don't have to do that. You can just double click it. Um, but you need to make sure you unzip it and turn it into a folder. Now to open it, two ways to do it. You can just go into the folder and double click this little package file or you can launch BlueJ on a Mac. It'll probably be in the dock. Um, on Windows, you know, do your little start menu thing and find BlueJ. Um, and then from here, you can do project, open project, and then go ahead and find it. This is in Knox 141, temp. And then you notice this little hello icon is no longer showing up as a folder. Uh, that's because BlueJ will treat any folder that has this special package BlueJ file in it as a BlueJ project and just open it kind of as a unit. Um, so that's what I'm going to choose to do to open this up. And then you'll see that well, I had a different version of it open from earlier. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, so you'll see what I've got here. Bam! I got my stuff in here. It's got three um, examples in it that we're going to look at. So whenever there's examples from class, this is how they'll be distributed. It'll be a zip file on Moodle. You'll download the zip file. You'll unzip the zip file and then you'll open it with BlueJ. Um, all of your labs will start this way as well up until the end of the term when there'll be a couple of them, probably maybe actually just one or two, where you're going to be expected to just start with like a brand new uh, BlueJ file. So uh, what we're going to do is go through some stuff about BlueJ. Um, now the first thing I'm going to do is go back here and present again. There we go. Um, so we went through downloading and unzipping and doing uh, opening the project with BlueJ. Uh, now I want to show you the difference between source files um, and BlueJ files. So if we go here and open up Hello World, you'll see this vaguely looks like stuff. Um, this is Java code. We don't really know what that is yet, but we're going to learn pretty soon. But you can see it looks like useful stuff. Um, it's got some stuff highlighted. Uh, certain words are showing up in special colors. Um, stuff in between quotes is showing up in green. There's a nice indentation scheme going on. It sort of looks really useful. You'll notice up here it's sort of giving it away. This is source code. Now, if we go onto the file system and we just go directly into this hello file and then we find you know uh, hello world.java and we open this with a text editor like text edit uh, on Windows this would be notepad or wordpad you'll notice the text is all the same but it's not doing any of the fancy highlighting it's just kinda showing up here as text that's not 
uh, super useful. You certainly could program this way, and in fact, in like the 1950s and 60s and 70s, people did program this way, but people did a lot of other weird things in, back in those days, like, um, I don't know, oppress people and wear bell bottoms and other crazy things that, that we've finally figured out are stupid. So, you know, coding in black and white, not as cool um, as doing it with BlueJay where you get this kind of awesome full color, you know, indentation and we've got extra special options up here and things like that. It's a really cool environment. So that's kind of what we're working with. Now, if you note um, over here, you've got different kinds of files in the project. Um, you shouldn't need to go in here and look at the project directly. You should just be able to use it with BlueJay, but occasionally things go wrong, and occasionally people are just genuinely curious, and they'd like to know what the heck is going on. Um, and they're like, Spacko, why are you hiding all these details from me? So if you go in here to this hello example, the special package.bluejay file, um, this file just actually contains like one or two lines in it that just say, I'm a BlueJay project, open me. There's a readme, not much useful in there. Um, these .ctxt, these are context files. These, these, believe it or not, are just letting us know when you close the project and reopen it, like where are these physically located? If I move this down here and then close the project and reopen it, it wants to know to like stick this down here. So those are like, that's what that is. The things are really interesting, we've got the .java file, which we opened with text edit, and it looks kind of cool. We've also got for this hello world.java file, this hello world.class file, and then we've got this little cup of coffee, this little Java icon on it, um, saying that it's a class file. Now, believe it or not, um, the .java files, these are called source files. These are considered a high-level language. Uh, I know that looking in here at, you know, Hello World, looking at this and saying, like, you're calling this a high-level, human-readable language? This looks like gibberish to me. Um, yeah, okay, that that's certainly one possible way to look at it, but if we open this with uh, text edit, oh my god, text edit, where are you? And why do I have to look so far to find you? Text edit, hello, oh my gosh, you don't know my alphabet, there we are. Yeah, so if we look at this, there we go. This is even less readable. Um, oh, hey, look, 262 exams. Don't look at those in case you go on to major in computer science and take 262 next fall. Um, this is even less readable. There's, there's some parts of it that are kind of vaguely sort of readable, but then there's like these unprintable characters and various other weird things in here. This is not readable at all, and this is actually more readable than if you're just doing everything in binary with zeros and ones. So in general... Um, that we're not really excited about reading the class files directly. These class files have been what's called compiled. The process of compilation, um, what you're going to do is take the human readable stuff and you'll convert it to something that's more machine readable. And then the machine may itself take that and compile it from a machine readable format to an even more machine readable format and so on. And that's just one of the things that uh, we're able to do. Um, so that's source files, or .java files, and class files. Um, again, you don't really need to worry about this if you're using BlueJay because you'll just, you know, everything will look all hunky-dory. This doesn't even show you the class files. They're just kind of there. Um, but that's what's actually going on under the hood. So source code has a couple of important things in it. One note is there are what are called comments in there. These are special notes for the programmer that actually are ignored by the compiler. Uh, they don't show up in those class files at all. These are actually there for future programmers or for yourself. It's important to realize that uh, a lot of times you'll work on the same chunk of code, which might be thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of lines, for many, many years. And it may be the case that you do something now in January of 2014, and then in October of 2014, you have to go back to something that you did back in January, and of course you can't remember what you were doing. What were you doing last January? Like, I don't know. I, you know, if you were to ask me what code I wrote last January, I'd have no idea. So a lot of times you're leaving these comments either for other programmers you're working with or just for yourself in the future when, when future you would be like, hey, can you, can you hook me up with some knowledge about what's going on? And so the comment format, there's, there's two formats. 
there's what's called a multi-line format. So it starts with a slash star. Oh my god, that's right. I can't click on anything. It starts with a slash star and ends with a star slash, and then anything in there gets ignored. There's also a one-line comment, which is uh, slash slash, sometimes pronounced whack whack. Um, and that's everything from there until the end of the line is going to be a comment. So if we look back at our Blue Jay Hello World example, this is a multi-line comment. It starts with slash star, it ends with star slash, and then everything inside it is showing up in a special color. This is a comment. And then we've got some one-line comments here, slash slash, up until the end of the line. It's kind of graying this out, so your eye kind of travels over it. Um, that's a comment. Uh, I have been known to, you know, I'll be writing a grocery list. Um, I'll have an item on there, I'm not sure, like I don't know if we need butter, so I'll put like a slash slash in front of it, and when my eye looks at the list, I see the slash slash, and I'm like, oh, well, the butter's commented out, you know, and then like my wife looks at the list, and she's like, well, I don't know if we need butter, and I'm like, well, it's commented out, and she's like, why didn't you major in chemistry or something that makes sense? Like, some, sometimes you computer people say things that don't make any sense and you write things in this weird syntax. And, you know, that's just one of our, our many conversations um, where things I do don't make sense. And then, of course, things she does, like, don't make sense to me because she's a chemist. And, like, one of the differences between my field and her field is she has constraints of the actual physical universe where like there's things that molecules just don't do and if you want them to do those things you can't like hack nature to make that work whereas there's many things my code doesn't do but I can like hack it to make it do that this is like a huge difference and it's very frustrating for me to actually deal with the physical universe and have it not do what I want it to do so I'm actually really glad I'm not a chemist because um, it's a really hard field um, and then, you know, I think, I think my, my wife's happy she's not uh, a computer scientist because um, she actually likes being able to manipulate atoms of the real world. It, it's kind of very awesome. Um, so to each, each his or, or her own. Um, okay, so other things um, to note. Uh, there's a lot of things that are basically magic incantations, what's known as boilerplate. Of course, now I realize the term boilerplate probably doesn't really make any sense. Boilerplate are like things like headers of letters um, that just kind of have to be stamped out without really understanding why. Sort of like when you write a letter like for a, a, your college applications or something like that. You know, you put like the return address and then you put um, the person's address and then you put the date and that stuff's not really very interesting or important but it like has to be there for formality. There's a lot of things in computer science to start with that you're not really going to understand and it sort of sucks but the way I always say it, it's like well these are magic incantations it's like in Harry Potter why is it expecto patronum like I don't know because they're magic words so the ones we're primarily concerned with are this public static void main open paren string that has to be capitalized uh, open close square bracket args close paren this is going to show up to start what's called the main method of like every executable program you're going to write. You don't have to memorize this. It's going to be provided for you. That's one of the reasons we provide starter packages. But uh, sadly, you know, you have to actually know that it's there. Public class hello world. This is going to show up at the beginning of every file. It's not necessarily going to be called hello world, but public class something's going to be at the top of every file. We'll learn more about why this stuff is like this later in the term, but for now, it just has to be there, and because it's not theoretically interesting, uh, it's just going to be provided for you in the starter packages that you download, and if you want to write your own code that needs it in there, you're perfectly welcome to go ahead and uh, copy-paste it. Um, you know, you're not going to have to memorize this. It's not going to be like, you know, exam question number one public static blank main and you have to write in void or you fail the class like I, I really don't care if you memorize this you're perfectly welcome to copy paste it but you do need to know that like something that was in some other program has to be there um, okay so now we get to some of our first kind of deliverable stuff uh, identifiers so we got public class hello world um, so hello world is the name of the program um, you can name your programs anything that's a legal identifier. So an identifier, this is our first concept. Um, this is like a name of something in Java. Uh, 
it's something that you would name a program or a variable or something like that. So something that you're going to create, you need to give it a name. The name has to be an identifier. has to start with a letter, either upper or lowercase, or an underscore, which is followed by zero or more letters, digits, or underscores. Um, and by convention, the name of your program should start with an uppercase letter, whereas other identifiers should not. Um, so here's your first review question, or RQ. Go ahead and log into Moodle um, and find uh, review question, or uh, RQ number one. Um, it's going to be like a little assignment. And so which of these are not legal identifiers? Go ahead and uh, answer that. And then once you've answered it, you know, pause this and then go answer that and then come back and push play again. So which of these are not legal identifiers? Did you come up with... Oh, wow, I sort of changed that from one to the other. That's a terrible idea. Um, did you come up with B? If you came up with B, you are correct. Um, this is not a legal identifier. Why? Well, it has to start with a letter or an underscore and actually starts with a digit. If you go back to our rules, back a couple slides, has to start with a letter, upper, lowercase, or an underscore, followed by zero or more letters, digits, or underscores. So it can have digits, but not in the first position. This has a digit in the first position. The other ones don't, so B is wrong. Which of these are not legal identifiers? Here we're making references to community. Um, so we've got Inspector Space Time, Inspector Space Time, and Inspector Space Time, or is it all of the above, none of the above? Answer this on the Moodle, come back. Did you come up with C? If so, you're correct. Uh, this is not a legal identifier because you can't have spaces in it. I don't know if you know a lot of computer science people, but if you notice, we like will almost never have file names with spaces in them because like a space means it's not a legal identifier. Why would you put a space in a file name? Um, I certainly do that. I always put dashes between everything, even if I'm on Windows or Mac, where like spaces and file names are legal. I, I just never do that because I'm like trained by these, you know, identifier rules. And finally, one more: which of these are not legal identifiers? So go ahead and answer that on Moodle. Come back. Did you come up with D? All of the above. If so, you're correct. Uh, none of these are legal identifiers because you can only have letters, digits, and underscores, and a, a, a smiley face here, a, a colon and a paren, these are not letters, digits, or underscores. These are other things, so these can't be part of these identifiers, so none of these are actually legal. So here's something to think about. Uh, what does this look like? This is a legal statement in Java uh, that prints out hello. Uh, does this look like anything from another course or some other discipline or subject that you may have studied? Um, so I'll tell you what it does. System.out.println means print, and then hello is the thing to be printed. Um, and then semicolon means, you know, end of line. So uh, I, I, I've been giving this example for a, a, several years now, and um, what I wanted to hear, I wanted somebody to say, hey, this looks like a mathematical function f of x, where f is this print line function, and the argument x is, hello, the thing to be printed. I was hoping people would look at this and go, oh my god, mathematical function. Wow, that's a great example, Spacco. You're just so amazing. You've you know, made me see computer science already. But you know, in practice, here's some of the answers I got. Well, it's a semi-random collection of letters and other stuff. Okay. And then my favorite answer that I've ever gotten to this question, or possibly any other thing I could possibly do on the first day or two of a computer science course, Somebody told me, well, this is a bibliographic entry using some non-MLA format that I'm not familiar with. Um, and so my first instinct upon hearing that was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. This was from a senior history major who was like, hey, maybe I'll, you know, take a science course. Um, he did really well, by the way. And he, like, works, you know, on Wall Street and makes, like, you know, like ten times what I do at this point. Really, really smart guy. But this was his first instinct. And at first I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, no, that absolutely makes sense because we're taking all the, like, normal rules of punctuation. We're like, well, semicolon now means it's the end, and these dots sort of show up in the middle. I don't even call them periods. I call them dots because they're clearly not being used like a period. And then we have, like, quotes and parentheses, but they're sort of in a weird place. Um, so it does kind of look like a weird bibliographic entry. And so this is one of the things to keep in mind, 
you actually have to unlearn whatever you had learned about grammar. So computer programming languages, they use these grammatics little symbols, but they use them as pure symbols. Um, in other words, they're just a thing that we can give whatever meaning we'd like. Now this, like, this may contradict everything you've learned about English grammar for your whole life, about what a period means and what a semicolon means. From, to a computer scientist, they don't mean anything other than what the rules of the grammar of the particular language you're speaking define them to mean. English grammar defines them to mean one thing. Uh, the grammar of Java defines them to mean something else. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a bit of programming that's in your head that you kind of have to unprogram. You have to be able to look at a, a, a period and look at a semicolon in parentheses and say, well, those mean what this grammar of Java says they should mean. So you'll notice part of that was in quotes. Uh, we have what are called string literals. Everything in the double quotes, this is called a string literal. A string in computer science is a highly technical term. Just kidding, that's sarcasm. It literally means a string of letters. Actually, it's more precise than letters. A, a string of printable stuff. So letters, numbers, punctuation, whatever. Um, and system.out.println will literally print exactly what's in the double quotes. Um, so some things... Um, are not inside double quotes. Those have a special meaning to Java. So, for example, you know, if we go back here and look at our really simple hello world example, system that out that print line, this is the thing that says, hey, print the thing. Um, you know, this is like the function f. Then we've got the parentheses. Inside it is the argument. It will print literally what's ever inside these quotes. You, you could put inside these quotes system that out that print line, and Java would literally print system that out that print line. That's just what it does. Um, and of course, my goofy example for this, insert anecdote about childhood, you know when you're a kid and you like really want to drop f-bombs but you can't because you're a little kid and you're not allowed to say those things? So you wait until some grown-up, usually it's your grandfather, you know, slips up and like says something and then you just go ahead and repeat it and then your mom is like, hey, don't drop f-bombs in the kitchen, you know, you know, young lady or young man, and you're just like, oh, I didn't say that. I was quoting what grandfather said. And then you got to drop an F-bomb, and your grandfather gets in trouble with your mother. And so, like, everybody wins except, well, basically you win and everybody else lo And actually, maybe you lose too because your, you know, vocabulary becomes very coarse and you learn to, you learn to, you know, curse like a sailor or something like that. But, um, but anyway, uh, it's going to print literally whatever's inside those double quotes. Now, this, of course, begs a profound question. Um, well, that's not the profound question, but um, we'll, we'll do this one first. Uh, string concatenation. Now, sometimes you want to print something that's very long. Uh, you can actually use a plus sign to concatenate two shorter strings together. So here we've got system that out that print line, and then in quotes we've got this is, and then a plus, and then down here in the next line, and then in quotes, too lengthy to fit in one line. Um, so if we were to execute this program, you know, what would Java do? Well, it's going to go ahead and just print that. And in fact, we have an example of that over here in our really simple... Nope, that isn't it. Long message. There we go. So if we sort of look at this, we've got this is a... Oh, let's pretend that wasn't there. This is a really long message that is very, very important. Well, I want to go ahead and run that. Now, you notice it's got these hash marks in it? That's because I went in here and changed it, and now I need to compile it. How do I compile it? I right-click on it and say Compile. Now I right-click on it again and run it, and we run this, and you notice this is a very, very long message that is really, really important. Well, why are we getting this? Why is there no space there? Well, remember, it's printing literally whatever's in there. And so what's in this string doesn't have a space at the end of it. And then this string here doesn't have a space at the beginning. So it's literally concatenating those together. The word concatenation, by the way, is a little weird. Concatenation is like a highly technical way of saying just stick two things together. Um, so in Java, we have the word concatenate rather than like stick together. And then um, instead of having a fancy term, we literally have string, which means a string of printable stuff. Um, so there we have strings, string literals, and concatenation. 
here's a profound question that is was being begged by two slides ago. What is the one character that can't easily be included in a string? Think about that. What's, what character is really hard to make a string literal? The answer, of course, double quote. How would you print a double quote? As soon as you put in a double quote, that ends the string. And the answer, of course, is you stick a backslash in front of it. Uh, so we could say the string, if we want to say he said, quote, hello, would, would put the quote to start a string, would say he said, now we want to put a quote. Well, if we put a quote that ends the string, so we would backslash quote, hello, backslash quote, quote. So now this quote and this quote, because they have backslashes in front of them, those are being treated special. Um, and then this quote and this quote, that still begins and ends the uh, string. Now, of course, there's a the question, well, how do you print a backslash? Because now a backslash means something else. It means that the character after me should be treated special. Um, well, clearly, we just put a backslash in front of the backslash. So if we want to print a backslash, we'd say, you know, this is a backslash, and then double backslash. And then the first backslash means the character after me should be treated special. Bam. This is also called escaping or an escape sequence. Um, and it, it, it shows up all, all the time in, in computer science. For some reason, we seem really into escape sequences. I think that's it. Yep, that's all I've got for slides. So, uh, yeah, that's what we've got for the start of uh, CS 141. God, 36 minutes. Okay, I'm going to stop this.